to introduce uh, the topic of the reliability, usability, and acceptability testing of uh, modified early warning systems. So I wanted to introduce the panel. We'll start with Lexi Utrell. She is, uh, has been an RN since 2009. I think uh, graduated originally from Covenant School of Nursing and then has, has since uh, obtained her BSN and MSN from Lubbock Christian University. Erin uh, Whitley in the peach over here has been a nurse since July of uh, 2002 and you actually graduated from Tech, I think, mm -hmm. uh, with your BSN. Jamie Roney, Jamie's, there you are. Okay, uh, you actually started as an LVN, 1990, I <laughs> um, South Plains College and uh, went on to get your BSN from Texas Tech University and you're in the graduate program here at LCU, so a tech, so you will have that in a couple years, is that right? December. December, fabulous. And uh, last but not least, Kim Stunker. Oh, Jessica too. <laughs> Kim Stunker, you've been an RN since 2006, is that right? And you're currently in the BSN program here at LCU and you will graduate in August. In August. Yes. And Jessica, um, you're an RN since August of 2002 and you're a Abilene Christian University graduate. So uh, all of you I know, along with uh, Dr. Long, have done some excellent work on our MU system, and I'm really excited for you to share some of, of your research with us. So thank you all very much. everybody. Um, I have a few disclosures to begin with. So a few disclosures to begin. Um, if you would like to receive um, credit for contact hours, continuing education, um, you have to attend the majority of the activity, so 75%. You have to sign the roster, and you'll need to sign the roster that says for credit, see any credit. Um, and then you'll have to submit a completed evaluation at the end. We'll collect those outside of the classroom, and then we'll hand you a certificate, and we'll have to have you write your name on the certificate in our presence. Can't let it leave without a name on it. So um, those are the requirements, and then you'll get one um, contact hour credit for today's presentation. And you can read the rest of those disclosures at your leisure. Didn't you read them quickly? <laughs> um, our objectives today are listed here. We're going to start off by just giving you an overview of our research plan and then articulate the why behind incorporating surge criteria and sepsis screening tool into our MUSE tool. Then we're going to look at um, the process of reliability testing. We're going to summarize our testing methods for acceptability and usability of our tool. And then we're going to talk about the current state and um, discuss some lessons that we learned together as a research team. So to begin, why would we develop a MUSE tool and what exactly is a MUSE tool? Uh, well, MUSE stands for Modified Early Warning System. And so although we already have rapid response in place, um, this is kind of a precursor to rapid response. So although rapid response plays a critical role in identifying the patient who's at risk um, and helps save lives, the MUSE scoring system can help our healthcare system and others who put it into place um, to take the next step and identify those at-risk patients even earlier and hopefully save more lives. And um, one of the things that we really looked into was building a very reliable tool so we, as you hear today, we did a lot of testing um, to make sure that that tool was reliable, usable. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that if we utilize this correctly and consistently, that hopefully it will dramatically reduce, maybe even eliminate missing those patients who are at risk. 
And um, one of the things that made our Muse tool really different from a lot of the published uh, Muse tools that are out there is that we incorporated the SIRS screening criteria into it. So we're not only identifying patients who are at risk, but specifically pa patients who are at risk um, for developing sepsis. And so you'll see that we incorporated the national guidelines uh, for sepsis into our criteria as well. So, um, our biggest aim was to really identify a structure and a process where we would identify the deteriorating sep and septic patients. Um, and we wanted to do that through not only identification, but then prompting them to follow um, an evidence-based algorithm in how to hopefully save them from any life-threatening events. So a little context and background. Um, we realized that in our kind of current situation, we didn't have anything in place at Covenant to identify those patients who were at risk for deterioration or, or who were at high risk for developing sepsis. Um, and so what we really wanted to do was look at how, how can we do that. And so um, the reason we really looked at incorporating sepsis into it is because if you aren't aware, sepsis has a really high mortality rate. And at Covenant, we particularly were drilling into that because um, our rates were also high. So someone who's diagnosed with severe sepsis has a 29 to 50% uh, mortality rate. And um, it's estimated that about $17 billion annually go to treating sepsis here in the United States. And that's approximately 2.5% of all of the healthcare expenditure in the, in the United States. So if nothing speaks to you, um, if, if lives don't speak to you, maybe dollars speak to you, that's a tremendous impact on our health care system. So anything we can do to lower that mortality rate is going to be a big impact. And that cost will be a big impact. Um, and so as part of a quality improvement initiative, Covenant Health got an interdisciplinary team together. We had support from our leadership, including our chief nursing officer and several directors. Um, our director of critical care, our children's director, and our med surge director were all involved in supporting us. Our chief medical officer was involved in supporting us. We had lots of physician involvement, respiratory therapy, nurse leaders, educator, educators, and um, managers. And then we also had a lot of involvement of staff and charge nurses, um, in the, especially in the initial phases as we were trying to get buy-in and develop the tool itself. So a little more background about sepsis and the importance of building a tool that would identify those at risk, particularly of sepsis, is at um, Covenant, 789 annual cases, and it's one of our leading causes of death. Um, so we really felt like this was something we had to address, and any way that we could impact those sepsis numbers positively was a worthwhile cause. And so that's one of the reasons we incorporated it in, into this tool. Um, the average mortality rates at Covenant are about 21% for septic patients. Average cost goes up to $14,500. And so early identification is crucial. And oftentimes, if we miss those patients who just have SIRS and they're in those early stages of that uh, systematic inflammatory response syndrome and they haven't gone to full-blown um, advanced sepsis, then um, we can really save lives and if we miss that then the likelihood of them dying in that 24 to 48 hour window is is dramatically increased so um, again someone diagnosed with sepsis has a 29 to 50 percent mortality rate so our plan based on all of that data was really to just decrease that sepsis mortality rate uh, we wanted it to be less than one so our goal is 0 0.84 or better which would be lower. And um, we also wanted to reduce the variable cost down to just over $4,000. And you saw that it was up to above 14, so that would be a dramatic decrease in cost. Um, and so the plan to do this, one of the tools to, to recognize this and reduce sepsis rates and cost is to develop a screening tool and then make sure that that screening tool is based on sound evidence and then to make sure that that screening tool is something that's reliable and usable and in easy um, to use for our nursing staff. So the challenge set before us to identify those at-risk patients and help reduce um, 
the events of codes outside the ICU and um, identify those patients before they code or before we have to call a rapid response team um, was our big challenge. And um, so really that led to conceptualizing this tool and, and it having an assessment component and again an algorithm component that would lead you to how to treat that specific patient uh, that you'd identified as at risk. So um, what we did was we selected some pilot units and we selected those pilot units based off of criteria we thought was important. So we looked at the pilot units that had the highest rate of codes outside the ICU and we looked at the pilot, we also piloted units um, that were the highest utilizers of our rapid response team. And then we have two campuses, so we chose one, camp one um, unit that was on the other campus just so that we would have a full scope of um, data to look at. Um, and uh, we based our algorithm on physiological findings and we did a lot of research and looking at data and lit review and time spent in that to make sure that what we came up with was evidence-based. Um, <clears throat> and yes, it's important to note that um, you'll see the sentence there at the bottom um, says that the development of the tool really was done by charge nurses and staff nurses. Um, we are all educators and we wanted to support the use of this tool and we wanted to help train people on how to use it. We wanted to test it. We wanted to kind of experience this research process so that then we could encourage others to do it as well. Um, but we didn't want to come up with the tool and then tell our staff, here's something that you have to use. So we really tried to make it a shared governance process and let our staff nurses and charge nurses design the tool and change it up uh, and kind of help us determine what it should look like and how it should flow and things like that. So um, our recommendation is that we use this structured tool and process for identifying at-risk patients um, and or patients who are at risk for sepsis and follow the identified and defined algorithm um, using physiological and laboratory findings that are all evidence-based. And um, if we use this standardized approach, we should be able to identify patients before those life-threatening events occur and hopefully and this will help the nurse in not just using that intuition and that gut feeling, but will help kind of um, replace that and define that a little better so that they have a quantified, standardized way to reinforce their gut feeling so that they're not just acting on gut, but they have that gut feeling and then it's reinforced by this tool that helps them identify those patients that are at risk. It also should help improve um, communication amongst the healthcare team because we're prompting them to identify and communicate with other people on the healthcare team. Um, help, hopefully it'll help improve their clinical decision making because especially we heard from those who had less experience that this was a really helpful tool and help them to identify patients that they might have missed. And so if they start to identify those through use of the tool, then maybe they'll be able to identify them more easily without, without the tool in front of them. Um, and should help positively impact our failure to rescue, our failure to communicate, and our failure to plan. So some key players, as I mentioned, nursing staff, especially on med surge and telemetry units, our shared governance team, the shared governance team that really conceptualized the tool and gave us feedback on um, kind of the research that we had brought together on what this should look like and how this should flow, and helped include innovative pieces like sepsis our nursing directors and our chief nursing officer were vital in making sure that this is a su success without um, administrative buy-in and support. There's really no point in trying to do any of this, just like there's no point if you don't have that staff buy-in. Um, and then having us as professional development specialists um, really be members of the research team and try to lead this process and then do things like this to share our lessons learned and tell people that if we can do research, anybody can do research because that terrified me. I didn't like taking it in my undergrad. I'm about to start my master's program in the summer and just the thought of research. It's the one class that ooh, gets me nervous and makes my hands sweat. But now that I've participated in this uh, with such a good team and with Dr. Long really giving us lots of guidance and support through this, um, I feel like I can do it again and I feel like I can help other people start to do this. So it is a doable thing and that's kind of a really neat component that came from it. 
Um, and then we really wanted to make sure that, again, this wasn't just something that we pushed upon people, that, but, and it wasn't just shared governance, but it was a collaborative interdisciplinary thing. So physicians were also part of this, respiratory was also part of this, bedside charge nurses. Um, and we really wanted them to take the lead in this, the lead in the response system and testing it and helping us uh, pilot it. And then eventually we want them to be comfortable so that they'll actually use it on a day in day out basis. Um, again, they gave us recommendations, offered support, and um, our intent is really to empower them and um, help them to work better together and address those patients' needs in a timely matter, manner. Excuse me. Um, so we hope that the MUSE tool has a logical flow and a logical fit within the processes that we already have in place at Covenant. So we didn't give you everything in the tool because we haven't published this officially, so we didn't want to give away all of our secrets. But um, there is an example of the tool up there. Um, and so basically it looks at uh, white blood count, it looks at bottle signs, it looks at lactate level. Um, and again, we based all this on research and data that was already out there and then our own goals within Covenant. Um, and so again, this is a guide. It is not an all-inclusive catch everything. We don't want this to replace um, critical thinking, but it should be a tool to enhance critical thinking and patient assessments. Um, so we, we want to make sure that people didn't think this was a replacement for clinical judgment. Every tool that we have out there should just be something that assists with clinical judgment, um, but we wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, and so any patient that falls outside of the normal parameters um, could trigger a score that would prompt a response and you see we color coded it so that if it's green then that's just someone we continue to observe and assess. Yellow tells us there, there could be something we need to watch more closely and so the algorithm is over there on the side in the color coded area so that you would immediately once you've scored them as a certain color know what to do based on your findings. Um, and then we wanted to make sure that um, the nurses weren't fearful in contacting a doctor. Um, even in some of our testing, we had nurses who wouldn't necessarily follow the algorithm. They'd say, well, it says to do this, but what I would really do is, um, and so we hope that this will help guide them in being really proactive um, and going ahead and notifying physicians, even when they might not have before. Um, and not hold off on that, but rather empower them to make the decision and make the contact. So this is our research design process. Um, we did uh, phase one, we did tool conceptualization as a shared governance team. And then we said, you know what, we might should really do this the, the right way. <laughs> so we kind of started a little backwards because we didn't really plan on doing this as a research project until we got started. And then we thought, we might should look at this and really do it the right way. So we took a step back, and that's when we did um, a lit review. Um, and so we did an exhaustive lit review. We had to do a couple different lit reviews to find everything we were looking for. And then we moved on to um, piloting the tool and then testing the reliability and usability of the tool. And that's kind of where we are now. Um, and then we'll move into phase four and phase five as we go into the future. And so um, phase two, we really developed our question. And interestingly, um, and you'll, you'll kind of hear this in lessons learned, but interestingly, we kind of started off again not knowing what we were doing. So we did what we thought was an exhaustive lit review. And then we got together as a team and developed our question, which really should have guided our initial lit review. But it led us to secondary and third lit reviews um, and searches. So um, it was interesting. And now we know better. And um, so it helped us identify uh, what current evidence was out there. And there is quite a bit on MUSE and pediatric PUs, um, but we did find some gaps, especially in relation to sepsis. So um, we validated the physiological components that should be a part of it and selected a patient population for use. And then we moved on to phase three where we piloted that. And um, it led to some changes and revision based on feedback from um, using the plan do uh, check act cycle of change. And then we moved, we will hopefully uh, move into, uh, we did do phase four, the reliability and usability testing um, in the fall. And um, it was really fun because we used simulation and you'll hear more about that in a minute. And then again, we made revisions based on the feedback we got in simulation 
um, using that Plan Do Check Act cycle. So, I'm going to pass it on to Erin. <coughs> Well, thanks again for having us. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little about reliability. My friends on our team know that I really enjoy the simulation lab. I have a lot of fun in there, and it's kind of like playing with dolls. So they um, granted me <laughs> the privilege of handling, well, organizing reliability with their help, a whole lot of their help. Um, so what we did was we went over to the simulation center at Covenant that we are very blessed to have, and we set up standardized patients four different scenarios and we ran 25 nurses from 12 different units through those scenarios using very controlled situations um, any participants that had had any prior knowledge of MUSE were automatically disqualified we told them thank you very much but we don't need you today we wanted people that really knew nothing about MUSE before they showed up they might have looked at the tool before but if they had really ever worked with it or heard our education that we provided to the pilot units, we disqualified them. Um, so we developed four scenarios using low fidelity mannequins. Basically, we'll have a picture here in a minute, but we had mannequins with assessment findings just labeled all over them so they didn't really have to question anything. Um, and we brought our um, participants, sorry, couldn't think of the word. We brought our participants in, we tried to keep them isolated. We kept them in kind of a holding area until we were really ready to do the testing with them then we brought them in and we tried to give them a dry run um, as i said we used as controlled a situation as possible so we wanted very little human interaction we wanted to prevent our bias from seeping in um, if they had any prior experience with us that wasn't a good experience we didn't want that to affect them anything that I might say differently than one of the other researchers said differently we didn't want that to affect them so we started out really with just written instructions this is what we want you to do we tried to give them step by step um, again that changed a lot throughout the course of our testing the first day we thought it was perfect we had a great little script that we handed them and nobody really seemed to know what to do with it so then we turned it into okay step one do this step two do this step three they still didn't really know what to do with it and as educators it was really killing us because we thought education was the key part of it and once we added that education component where we walked them through scoring a patient first we got significantly better results so yay for education we were we were right on that one um, but we also wanted to produ provide producibility so we knew we weren't going to get all of our testing done in one day so we knew we had to set something up that could be replicated day after day and even when one of us wasn't there the others would be able to replicate it I was sick one day and they ran it great without me so we did that um, all information that was needed was provided in the simulation so they had vital signs if you can tell in the one picture um, we were pretty low fidelity we actually just wrote them on a piece of paper at one point and put them up in the room on a monitor so that it looked like they were on there we gave them their urine output in a urinal and they didn't even have to measure it because we were afraid they would measure it wrong so we wrote urine output for the last hour is this um, trying to eliminate any variables we gave them a chart as you can see there's a chart in the picture with labs in it um, level uh, level of consciousness was written on a note card on the patient's chest so lots of times they would get to that and they would kind of stop and say well how do I know level of consciousness and I said well go and assess your patient and they'd look down and, oh okay and they'd write it down. Um, oxygen therapy, which was actually interesting. We ran into a couple issues with oxygen therapy when it came to a venting mask. Um, we found that we need to provide some education to some of our staff about venting masks. So that was kind of a useful tool to take back to our everyday jobs. Um, and we used real sepsis patient data. We were blessed to have Jamie on our team. So she had plenty of patients charts for us to look at to find what we needed on that. So here's another image of our tool. The d tool was designed to be used at the bedside. Hopefully the nurse is carrying it with them. As soon as they take vital signs, they record them on the MUSE tool because we want to catch that patient that's in a yellow, orange, or red situation immediately. We don't want it to wait until 7 p.m. when they're finishing out their charting and go and say, oh, my patient's been orange for eight hours now. That's not going to help us because at that point, they may have already deteriorated so we want to catch them as quickly as possible 
Um, after the initial testing, the tool was changed dramatically. Um, we started out where they had to keep a tally in their head of their score. So they saw temp and they scored it a one and they had to either mark that down on a scratch piece of paper or keep up with it in their head. Um, then they would score the next one, they had to keep up with it in their head or on their sheet. And we were getting really poor results with that. So we had a recommendation af after a few that it would be really good if there was a way to tally it, to score it down the sheet. So we added that and we did see improved results after we did that. Um, and every time that we thought the tool was perfect, someone would very kindly come in and show us how wrong we were. Um, the very first day of simulation, we got through three people and we called a complete halt to everything. We were so distraught, we called Joanne, not knowing what to do, and she said, this is research, good job. <laughs> So we right then and there, we called graphics, we made changes, and then we made changes again, and we made changes again. I mean, we had greater than signs pointing the wrong way. We had words misspelled. <laughs> I don't know how anybody ever gets a form perfect. And I'm sure there's probably still something wrong with it, but if there is, tell us later, not today. <laughs> not today. Um, and so here are our reliability results. We found that the harder the scenario got, the more complicated the patient got, the less our reliability was so great. So um, as you can see with green, we were pretty good. Yellow went up a little bit, then orange dropped, and then red for some reason got a little bit better. I think once the patient was really, really sick, they knew they were really, really sick and needed to call somebody. Um, one of the really interesting things we learned on the first day of reliability testing was that we had to be really specific and really detailed with nurses. Um, we had our red scoring, I believe, at an eight, and six is the score that would trigger you to automatically call the rapid response team. And two nurses came through initially, scored the patient an eight, and said, well, I wouldn't score them a red because red says it's equal to six, not greater than or equal to six. And we were like, seriously? You wouldn't score them a red? No, because red says equal to six. I don't know what eight is. And they were adamant about it. So we very quickly changed that greater than or equal to. So for our green assessment, we really wanted to test. One of our measures on the tool is the lactate, because we know the lactate of greater than four is a great indicator of sepsis. So um, only thing that was wrong on our green scenario was a lactate, and we wanted them to say, they scored a zero, they're green, but I'm going to go ahead and tell rapid response team that they need to come see them because they have a lactate of four. Um, and we had fairly good results with that, as you can see. The yellow, they had to note that they had low urine output, high respiratory rate, and elevated WBCs. And then on the orange, they had a high heart rate, high respiratory rate, and low WBCs. And on the red scenario, everything was wrong with them. They had a low temp, low blood pressure, high respiratory rate, high heart rate, and then that was when the Vinny mask came in. And they had high WBCs. And that is how we did our reliability testing. Here are some comments that some of our participants gave us, which we had really good feedback. We feel like we got great buy-in from the ones that have done the testing so far. Um, one of them said, at first, upon learning, I was slightly confused on where the numbers went, but once in a scenario, it all made sense. And then another one said, numerous scenarios allowed me to become more comfortable with its use, which was another thing we noticed so that we made, sh after we noticed people were getting better, after two or three scenarios, we um, shuffled, shuffled the order. So one person would do green first, and then the next person would do yellow first, and we just made sure that we made a rotation. Um, another said, I like how well controlled the experiment was it will be interesting to see the results. And I liked how well controlled the experiment was too. I'm very much a yes, it's right, and no, it's not right person. And this was so great that I got to put one, it's right, or two, no, it's not right. It was fabulous, it was the best thing ever. Um, and 100% of subjects reported that simulation was an effective method um, to clinically test a tool, or to test a clinical tool, that's what I meant. Okay, now Jamie's gonna talk to you. I'll give you a little more background. Before these guys came on board, I got called into Karen's office, our CNO, and, along with a friend, and we were asked to kind of develop something similar to what the Children's Hospital had done, which is the pews that was part of Marguerite's doctoral work. 
Um, and basically, um, it was suggested that we do this using shared governance. So that truly came from our leadership that said, okay, I know you guys are working on this, but go back and you too facilitate shared governance and development of a tool. So truly, if you know me, which I think a lot of y'all or most of y'all do, it's very hard for me to keep my mouth and opinion, my mouth shut and my opinion to myself. But I did a really good job with this shared governance team. We had charge nurses, we had staff nurses from the units who would use the tool, and we had members of the rapid response team. We did do a literature review, and they did look at literature, and they had great ideas. We called people in ad hoc, and one of the things they did, which I think is tremendous, if you look at Muse tools and use tools that are out there, you'll see that they look at O2SAT. And what this team said was, well, if their O2SAT's 100, but they're on a non-rebreather, I'm still concerned. Or if their O2 sets 98 and they're on a BiPAP, I'm really concerned. And so it was great. One of the tweaks that we made to the tool was instead of using the standard that's out there internationally and just using an O2 sat, was we scored them based on the oxygen delivery device. And that came straight from the staff. So uh, it was really a great experience. And then we start looking at more literature and see that there's nothing really out there that demonstrated outcomes from using this tool. If you do your own lit search on Muse or Use, what you'll see is a lot of, was the staff satisfied with it? Do they, do they do the algorithm that you've asked them to do? But there was nothing really that demonstrated, did this make a difference in patient outcome? And I think that's what lit all of our fire because we want to know, does it make a difference in patient outcome? And so we got with Joanne Long, and we love Dr. Long, she's family now, and all of us as a group said we want to do research to see if this tool makes a difference. And Erin talked to you about the reliability of the tool, but the other thing we wanted to know is will our staff accept this tool and is it easy for them to use? Because what we don't want as a nurse is one more sheet of paper. If I come to you with just one more sheet of paper as a bedside nurse, and you don't see the value in it, or you don't find value in it, then it's not going to work. And if we don't make it easy to use, it's not going to work. So what we gave you is a sample of the survey. After they went through their four scenarios during the reliability testing, we took them to a safe, quiet, isolated environment, made them comfortable, and said, could you please fill out this for us about your experience today? And so they were given the opportunity to give us qualitative and quantitative data. And they were able to give us feedback um, after open-ended questions as well as scoring using the five-point Likert scale. So um, the acceptability, these are some of the comments that we got on our survey from staff nurses about the tool itself. Great for guiding nurses' actions. This is very valuable for our patients. I'm glad we are adding a piece of paper to nursing with purpose, value, and outcomes in sight. This will help nurses to follow what to do for a patient possibly needing extra help. The algorithm is great and removes all questions. So our feedback on the tool from staff nurses that were tested was very positive qualitatively. Um, our usability, I'm going to give you what our results were um, using quantitative data here, but our five-point Likert questions evaluating the tool ranged from 4.44 to 4.84, indicating that they agreed to strongly agreed that this was a valuable tool um, and was acceptable and usable. And as Erin said, we made 21 changes to the tool during our testing using Plan, Do, Act, Cycle. What that means is just because we're giving you a number of 25 research subjects, we had to start over every time. We couldn't count the ones that tested and we changed the tool. So indeed, we ran over, I don't know how many now. I have to look at Erin. She's the data keeper. Probably close to 100. Probably close to 100 nurses actually came through and tested our tool. The number 25 only represents those that tested the last version of the tool and that we could get enough data off of to say this was good. So granted, several people were exposed to our tool and we learned as we go, we tweaked as we go. Uh, just to give you the result of a couple of the questions. This question was testing or asking about acceptability of the tool. And what the question says is, I'm satisfied with the MUSE tool's purpose to identify the at-risk patients prior to clinical deterioration. Do they feel like what they just went through in a scenario is acceptable and will work to help them identify the at-risk for deteriorating patient? 
And as you can see, 58% of them strongly agreed that this tool would actually help um, with that. You see that 14% of them mildly agreed, 10% um, of them mildly disagreed, and we had one neutral. Now the next question is the testing usability. We were asking them, how do you feel like this tool will work in your practice? Is it easy to use? Um, can you easily complete this on every patient you go in and see? So we said the MUSE tool is useful in identifying the at-risk patients prior to clinical deterioration. 69% of them strongly agreed that this was a useful tool, with 24 more percent of them being a four, which was um, mildly agreed. So, we did ask a question about workflow, because we wanted to kind of feel, how do you feel like this would fit into your, your workflow? How, did, how would this fit into your assessment and your report and going about doing your job as a nurse? And we got some answers that didn't really fit that section, as you can see, but I wanted to give you some of their responses, because we kept getting more feedback on the value of the tool. So one of the nurses said, I believe it will work well once it seems helpful in catching people before they deteriorate. One said easily, meaning it would fit into their workflow easily. One said would fit. One said identifying high-risk patients to transfer to high risk of care, so they felt like it would help them know who to transfer. That that could help them determine who is at risk. It will help me quickly identify deteriorating patients. This is exciting to use every four hour assessments with vital signs. It will guide me to the proper way. So all in all, our nurses that came through and laid their hands on this tool and went through the scenarios found value in the tool that we were testing. And that to me meant more or as much as identifying the at-risk patient because that means they're going to use it. And we're not just throwing another piece of paper at them and it has value to them and value to the patient both. Now, um, again, some more comments. It'll be a good tool to use to monitor patient status and knowing when to notify physicians. With a variety of patients on the floor, it'll be beneficial for me to acknowledge the difference between patients and their condition. Guide, guide and simple and provided a snapshot of patient's current status misspelling there, sorry, is a simple composite grid, a description of patient status easily obtained with a large patient workload. Monitoring patients when questionable or unsure gives a set of algorithms to follow. It will add more paperwork, but the guide would be helpful to at-risk patients. Well fit, a part of my charting routine, um, might increase the ability to see patients in need earlier. And we had a really wide range of age, <laughs> really wide range and experience we had people come through that had been nursing nearly 40 years and we had people that came through that had been nursing under a year and we didn't even know because we didn't have less than a year as a choice so we had a very large variety and i will repeat what i think jessica said or reiterate that the younger newer nurses really seemed to get excited they wanted something to help them know when a patient was going bad. It helped them quantify what they were seeing. And in our lit review, we actually found one research study where they compared gut instinct to the use of a MUSE tool. And guess what won out? The MUSE tool. Gut instinct was not effective in that study. People think they know when a patient looks bad, but they didn't. Not when you can quantitatively measure physiologic changes and score it and you follow the algorithm. The other thing in our research that was very interesting to me was that some studies showed that it was an increase in usage of rapid response team and some studies showed there was a decrease in usage of rapid response team. And at first it, it kind of confused us all. We were like, why are we seeing all these mixed results? Come to find out, as you heard from Jessica, we chose our unit that utilized rapid response team the most and who utilized rapid response team the least. And guess what that happened to correlate with? The unit with the most code blues outside of the ICU and the unit with the fewest code blues outside of the ICU. The unit that utilized rapid response team the most had had zero code blues outside of the ICU in 12 months. The unit that utilized rapid response team the least had three times the number of code blues outside of the ICU in the previous year. And incredibly, guess what it did to rapid response team usage? The unit that used them the most, their rapid response team usage has actually decreased. The unit that used them the least, it's actually increased. So in our own pilot units, we saw what we were seeing in literature as far as you can have it increase or decrease your rapid response team usage primarily based on how you utilize rapid response team to begin with. So 
Um, I will turn over to Kim. So interestingly, um, all of Jamie's comments on usability, I actually today was preparing a, a poster and I put all of those in a Wordle, which identifies the words that are used the most often and it makes a pretty picture. And the biggest word that came out of that was patience, which to me really drives home what all of this is about. It's about the patience. It's about doing something that is best for our patients that really is going to affect the outcomes of our patients. So that was one lesson learned that we didn't have a chance to put in here because I just found it today. So, um, so our lessons learned, one should not be too eager to get started piloting a tool. It really should start with rigorous testing after development through a literature review. So we don't want to just shove something out there without having the evidence and the research to back it up. It's imperative to develop your clinical, clinical question first, allowing this to guide your literature search uh, for an answer and to identify gaps. As Jessica said, we just started doing literature review before we had a question, and once we realized we needed a question, it really helped focus our research and really helped guide that. Literature search terms may need to be modified to include similar terms or terms misspelled or spelled differently in other countries. Uh, there was a lot of research from Australia and uh, Great Britain and they spell things differently. So we were missing out on a lot of great research uh, until we realized that we needed to change that. There was a better respect for the process and developed form by test subjects than pilot floor staff. So the people that we actually brought in and ran through simulation uh, liked the tool and used it much better than the, tool, than the subjects on our pilot unit. So that just shows that when we, when we research something, when we have the why behind it and we're able to provide that to the staff along with really good education, it really increases buy-in. Testing of the tool demonstrated the flaws of the developed instrument, thus allowing for correction prior to implementation. As Jamie said, we made a lot of corrections to this tool, so uh, hopefully when it comes out, it's going to be the best tool until somebody points out something else that we need to change. <laughs> Simulation is an effective method of both testing a clinical instrument and gaining stake, uh, stakeholder buy-in through the demonstration of rationale. Um, what this really means is that nurses are hard-headed they have to understand the why. They have to see the value in it. And by doing simulation and really showing them this is why, let us run through this patient scenario of a patient that you may not think is sick, but when you score them this way, yes, they really are, and we can call and get help sooner. It really helped develop that buy-in. So we're going forward, going to try to use simulation to roll it out, because that's how we believe we're going to get the buy-in from the staff. Teamwork is essential amongst all stakeholders. Um, I would not be standing here without any of the team members, any of our ad hoc members. It was really important to have each and every one of us. We all played a very important role uh, in this research. We all brought something to the table, so very important. Nursing research success is dependent on a committed team and strong leadership. Nursing research is doable. I'm the only undergraduate of our group, and I was really nervous about research. They were like, we're doing research, and I was like, no, I'm still in school. I don't know how to do that. What? Um, but after having uh, such great um, advisory from Joanne and just uh, working together, it's, it's, not, it's not hard, and it's, it makes what we do evidence-based and real. So I'd like to um, point out our ad hoc research team members. Again, Dr. Long, who was just very, very beneficial to all of us. I, I know that we all owe her a great debt of gratitude. Um, Marguerite Fallon was also very important in our, our research team. Susan Sayari, <coughs> Julia Scott, uh, Dr. Ryan, who's our CMO, and then Clint Salaska was our rep respiratory therapist who had some input as well. Also, we want to acknowledge the shared governance team that really developed the initial tool, that really had a lot of great input. Um, at Covenant, we want to do things with shared governance. We don't want a bunch of leaders in an office making decisions for our staff. We want our staff to make those decisions. So um, we'd like to note, um, point out Jamie Roney, uh, James Morris, Rachel Chapman, Zane Ellis, Tiffany Johnson, Jonathan Ortega, uh, Crystal Carter, Lauren Lamb, Stephanie Hogan, and Gil Barkas. They were all uh, part of that shared governance team that really helped create this tool. These are our references. So at this time, we'll open the floor to questions. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, I have some questions for you, Dallas. <laughs> no. <laughs> I 
we got answers. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> Impressive work. I am just astounded by the work you guys have done. Everyone should be. Um, Jessica, you mentioned lives matter, money matters. It sure does. It does. Um, the most important thing is lives, though, and why is that? Because it could be me, and I want you guys to take really good care of me and identify when I'm, you know, perhaps not doing as well as I should. This is profound. You guys should walk away from here, not today, but every day when you are at work, and say, my gosh, I am making a huge difference in the lives of patients. That's why we're here. That's why we're called to do this work as administrators, as nurse leaders, as frontline staff. You know, th this is the most exciting thing anyone can do. Because it could be my mother, my sister. What, you know, this, this is just astounding work, you guys. It does matter. Always being proactive rather than reactive is always going to be better, isn't it? Um, just a few things. You know, it has been said by, um, I think it was Dr. Topjan in 2009, that any arrest that occurs outside of an ICU is preventable. So, my goodness, we don't want any arrests to happen. We want, we, want, we want our patients to be screened and a tool like this used, and what you're doing is wonderful. So we also know that when these patients are deteriorating on the floor and we don't have a proactive response to that, the outcomes are very poor. That's where your cost is. Cost in moral distress of your nursing staff, your families, and the cost of an ICU stay. And then, you know, your survivability from that arrest to discharge is very, very poor. So I commend you. You guys are doing wonderful work. Um, I just have a couple of questions for you. And I know you've already thought about these things. I, I know this. But so you're doing this work, and we're getting ready to implement, you know, the electronic health record. So how do you see this? How do you visualize this, you know, expanding? Who, who can address that? Jessica, I think we can address that best. We just had that conversation. Today. I, I anticipated someone might ask that question. Um, we originally thought that we would keep this as one of the few papers because it's just so beautiful and the color is just, it's prompting, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? When there's a difference and everything's black and white, this is different because the color speaks to you. That red says this patient's severe, that, you know, it just, it goes along with, with your natural thought process that green is good and yellow, oh, you better pay attention here and orange, oh, it's getting bad and then red is things are on fire, I gotta act, right? And so we thought originally that we'd probably keep that paper. However, um, there is a way, and so we'll be working with the um, team that is building it, because there is a way and we use it in the ED. I was part of the team that built the ED module last year. And so we built in that when there's a critical lab value, it shows up on the patient tracker screen as bright red. And so there is the same capabilities for us to um, utilize that color prompt to show up saying you have to take action and, and then you'd click on that and tell you the value that you have and action that you need to take. So we will be working with them and hopefully it will just work beautifully, but if not, we still have the paper version to help facilitate the process until we get where we need to be. And that's actually why we're kind of in a holding pattern and we haven't moved to the phase five and six where we do implementation and all of that because we really want our nursing staff to make this transition to an electronic medical record smoothly. So that's why it's on hold for now. Good. One, one other question, or maybe two other questions. So when, when you looked at um, the MUSE tool and the nurses who were inexperienced and those that had, say, 20 years of experience, was there any relationship between you know, liking the tool. I think you alluded to that. The younger nurses liked it. What did the older nurses say? Maxie, do you want to address that one? Um, we, we, had, we had a couple of different responses. Honestly, overall though, our response to the tool was very well accepted. Um, they said that it was um, something that they could use in their everyday practice. 
we did get a couple of those ones that say, well, this says that this patient's a red or this says that the patient's an orange, but I'm not really going to do what, you know, the algorithm says right now. I think I'm going to just watch this patient for a little bit longer. And, um, you know, there's always going to be those few stragglers that has to take a little bit to get on board. Um, but overall, I think everything that we had was just a good response. I mean, yes, we did see a difference in in the response from younger nurses, and in that saying, you know, anyone usually with less than five years of experience, I think, is what our our research had really shown. Um, but at the same time, there were nurses that have been nurses for a long time that said, you know, this is great because I wouldn't have called on this patient, and this gives me the ability to say, oh, you know, this this needs to be done. So, I don't know if y'all want to add anything else to that. I was going to say, let me go to the mic. The only conversation I had about that with my dear boss sitting over here was I went to her office one day and I said, they're absolutely going to have to sign a paper that they agree to follow the algorithm. Because if we have nurses that are told to do X, Y, and Z and just choose not to and feel like it's optional, then we're in trouble. Because we didn't just design an algorithm to go with the score just out of our hat or for the heck of it. When we say call rapid response team, let your charge nurse know, let the physician know, there's a reason why that score indicates those actions. And so I don't know if Karen remembers that conversation, but I'm like, please, when we implement this, can they just sign a piece of paper saying, I attest that I will follow the algorithm. To get true research results too, we have to know that they've done the interventions we've asked them to do, or we can't truly measure our outcomes. The outcomes will not be, not be true and real outcomes if they didn't do the stuff we asked them to do using the form. But I don't know if anybody else has something to add. So, I promise I'll get down right after this. Okay, <laughs> so are you, do you think it would be kind of rich to look at, you know, length of stay, the patients that the, the tool was used on and then were transferred out, and how long have they been in the hospital? The reason I'm asking, were they in the hospital less than 24 hours perhaps? Is there some applicability to using this I don't know, pre-hospital even, EMS or ED. Can someone speak to that? I'll let Kia, um, A lot of the research that we did read showed that patients do have signs of deterioration 24 hours before they arrest. And so, yes, it is applicable to look at what is their baseline before and you know a lot of these patients are coming in to the hospital sicker and sicker we all know that that we're getting very sick patients in our ed and then on the floors and and different things and so um yes absolutely we would love to see you know what did they score from the moment that we could have scored them and so that's one of the reasons that it was it was built into the emr um into the ed uh, originally because we wanted to see what what was this um their score at the beginning and then you know maybe in the future this could be a, a tool that we're using to make sure that we are placing patients appropriately in our hospital and you know saying you, when we when they're, when they're getting report on the floor say you know this patient's already scoring as a red why are they coming to med surge um, to make sure that we're getting patients placed appropriately in our hospitals and hopefully, like Marguerite said, any any code outside of the ICU is really not acceptable and it shouldn't happen. And so hopefully if we get these patients into the right place at the very beginning, we can cut down on our mortality risk. And and yes, we want to look at see, you know, what all are we affecting? Are we affecting length of stay? Are we affecting our morbidity, mortality, our cost of, of care? Um, all those different things we would really like to take into account. You know, depending on how broad we can get, we could get so broad that it's hard to juggle all those different things. But there's so many arms that could come off of this one research project. And I think, if you want, did you want to say anything else about this? Oh, I was just, uh, okay. I, just a comment was a lot of the research that we did initially, um, I talked about patients being identified in the ED. Um, so that was a lot of where um, other teams started their MUSE tool, was that as soon as the patient was triaged, they were given a color. So um, in future state, that is definitely something very important so that we, we know that color from the beginning. And that's just part of a routine handoff is this patient is a red, this patient is an orange, this patient is a yellow, and you need to watch them. So. 
And, and we actually did see that a couple of times in the pilot units when the charge nurse was receiving a report saying, you know, this, this may be an inappropriate admission. And so we, we did get a, few, a, a little bit of feedback already in just the pilot units um, that it was a very useful form. And the, the ED at the time was like, what? What do you mean they're orange? Um, but the, the charge nurse that was receiving that report um, really felt um, empowered to say, you know, this is, this is not appropriate for, for this level of care for this patient to come to. And if I can kind of wrap it up, because I see Dr. Long standing in the back. Um, one of the things we identified is that we're, we're keeping our focus on those um, med surge and tele units so that we can identify them and get them to the ICU or say this isn't appropriate to be placed here and they need to go straight to the ICU. Um, but that's kind of our focus for this particular research question. However, with every good research study, it just asks 10,000 more questions. So of course, could there be more research done on this? Yes, and we're gonna narrow our focus into reducing codes outside of the ICU in those areas and looking at the impact on sepsis measurements. So that's really our focus for this project, but there's a thousand more things that could be done on this. I really, I have to stand up to say this. As the primary nurse planner for Covenant Health, I want to tell you this is c &E. And I am so proud of all of you because of what you have done in terms of research, as educators, as nurse leaders. I want to use this as one of my sample activities when I apply for a renewal of our provider unit. You have done an outstanding job in so many ways. I will talk to you about all the different ways later. It's going to take a long time. <laughs> I am so proud of what you have done here. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.